All right, so in this video, we're going to be covering chapter four of the Baron's book, dealing with uh, Newton's laws of motion, covering his first law, second law, and third law, at the very least, in this video. Now, as a quick definition of his first law, basically what Newton said is that uh, all objects in motion will stay in motion, and all objects at rest will stay at rest, uh, unless acted on in an outside force. Basically, if uh, the total forces on an object equals zero, then uh, the velocity will be constant, some sort of constant number, one meter per second, five miles per hour, etc., or zero. In other words, if there's no force acting on an object, or if the vector sum of the forces all add up to zero, so you return to your start point, then uh, the velocity will be constant. You'll keep traveling in the same direction indefinitely. So for example, if we have this block uh, sitting on a table of some sort, intuitively your mind will tell you that that block will not suddenly move with some velocity to the right. That just isn't naturally going to happen. But why won't that just happen? Well, it seems sort of obvious. But it's because the sum of the forces acting on the block are zero. Now, the most intuitive force you'll notice everywhere on Earth is gravity, and that's pulling down uh, on the block with the block's weight. However, what you uh, may have forgotten about is that the block is being supported by this table. The electrons in the table down here are repulsing, or repelling, rather, the electrons in the block. So that table, too, exerts a, a opposite force sometimes called the normal force because it's perpendicular to the surface on this block. And because these two, if you were to take this normal force and draw it uh, tip to tail, uh, would bring you back to the center. So the sum of the forces is zero and this block moves at a constant velocity or with no velocity and uh, therefore it doesn't accelerate. In other words, its acceleration too is zero. Now, the first law has to do with inertia, which is basically a measure of an object's resistance to change in velocity, and this is usually measured in kilograms. So, if you have a block that weighs 10 kilograms, it's going to be a lot easier to move than a block that weighs, say, 1,000 kilograms. Basically, the same force will move this block easier than it will the large block. And that is sort of, uh, we'll cover that more in depth with his second and third law, but it should also be noted that Newton's laws only apply in what are known as inertial reference frames. And as you may have guessed from the term inertia, meaning uh, resistance to change in velocity, inertial reference frames are frames in which uh, you're moving at a constant velocity. So for example, um, if you're walking down the street with some V and you don't deviate, you just keep going on that sidewalk indefinitely, you're in an inertial reference frame. If you're in an elevator moving with some constant speed V upwards or downwards, you're in an initial reference frame. If you're in a spaceship floating through space, uh, at some speed v without the rockets turned on so you're not accelerating you're in an inertial reference frame so it's basically any frame at which uh, you're not accelerating and therefore you're moving at some constant velocity and that's where these laws all apply otherwise you get weird phantom forces that you have to account for now newton's second law is uh... perhaps one of the po most important in all of physics it basically says that any force acting on an object will cause it to accelerate or you know change its velocity proportional to its mass or inertia if you prefer so this is where you know the kilogram comes into uh, full force basically oh by the way this should be a net force so this is where you know the vector sum of forces if you have one going up one going down one going left or uh, right rather uh, then the object will accelerate to the right because there's no force to balance this out. In other words, your vector sum of forces is this right here. The up and down don't matter because they cancel each other out, so the vector net force 
will be that right there, therefore the acceleration will be going to the right as well. And the relationship between this acceleration and the net force, yes, they'll both always point in the same direction, but if this has an extremely large mass, then the acceleration will be extremely small. There's an inverse relationship between acceleration and mass. So as the object gets bigger, you require uh, more force to accelerate it at the same acceleration. Now as a quick note, we've already uh, discussed the units for acceleration and mass. So uh, the unit for mass, the SI unit, is the kilogram. Acceleration, we use meters per second squared. And to make this uh, equation dimensionally make sense, therefore, forces must be in kilogram meters per second squared. But that's kind of a mouthful. So scientists will tend to abbreviate this as one Newton, which is the SI uh, derived unit for force. Now the third law is the one that basically states for every action or every force there is an equal and opposite force. So if say you're a person pushing on a wall, let's say so you're exerting a force of person on wall. We usually call the person the agent because they're the one exerting the force and the wall would be, here let me write that down, the person would be the agent and the wall would be the object. That force is acting this way into the wall. Oppositely, because the wall is not moving, you're probably feeling a force exerted on your hands and that is the force going the other direction which is the force of the wall back on the person. So every agent object pair has two forces going on. There's one pushing on the other and the other uh, pushing back. Or you know the earth let's say pulls on the moon so the moon pulls this way but it's harder to measure but the moon too pulls slightly less or pulls with the same amount of force on the Earth, but has slightly less acceleration. So for example, if you have, let's say, a poorly drawn car, like I have right here, and it crashes into a fly. Let me put some wheels on that car, windshield. Uh, if it crashes into this fly, you may think, oh, the car exerts a much larger force on the fly than the fly does on the car. But that's not true. The force of the car on the fly is equal to the force of the fly on the car. So you might say, well, if the fly gets crushed, why doesn't the car then get crushed? And that all has to do with the second law, the mass times the acceleration. Because the car has a much, much, much bigger mass, its acceleration is basically zero. Oppositely, because the fly has a tiny mass, um, its acceleration has to be huge because both of these equal the same force. They equal, you know, the force of the car on the fly and the fly on the car. So, uh, just because one object exerts a force on a smaller object does not mean that smaller object does not exert the same exact force backwards. Rather, what you're observing in the catastrophic results for the fly rather than the car are a measure of the acceleration, how quickly that fly's head accelerates backwards into its wings and abdomen. Now this uh, reaction or this action-reaction pair is why forces always involve uh, two objects. We may treat simplistically you know, the rope as massless or whatever when we're spinning a ball around, but it should be noted that at least in the real world for every rope pulling a ball in, that ball too pulls outwards on the rope. Forces come in pairs. So you should know uh, from this video that if the sum of the forces equals zero, you move at constant velocity, that F equals MA, and that every force has an equal and opposite force from the agent object pair. Now in the next video we'll be covering uh, mass versus weight, so the kilogram versus the newton, as well as the usual forces we'll be dealing with in most of our physics problems.